Hey guys, today I'm here with some other video with you and I'll tell you, I'll speak about like how an engineer builds software. I thought it's a good subject or video, but um, let's start with what we can see. So interestingly, I noticed that no one shares this type of content. How do you think an engineer builds software? I'm a computer engineer developing software and hardware professionally since 2018. My area of expertise is designing software, drawing its architecture, and playing active role in developing and deploying. Over the years, I have developed dozens of mobile applications, websites, and web services. Now I'll tell you how I follow the steps from scratch in order. I already shared every link that you need, every diagram that you need in the description below. You can check that out. And also the, all the documents and GitHub repositories is also at the description. So right now I already opened my like steps in the screen and I'll go every one of them one by one. But of course these steps can be a little more detailed and I'll try to explain as best as I can. I'd like to state from the beginning that I didn't do everything in the field of coding. I just told you what we should do and why we should do it. You can check the GitHub repositories in the, in the description below for the coding examples, okay? So let's get started. So first step, listen to the client and take notes. So imagine, you are speaking with a client, he's constantly trying to tell you this the software you want to make. But I do not think that he will be able to explain everything in detail and clearly. Never ever. Clients explain everything simply as they can imagine it. You, on the other hand, should not take none of his wishes and rewrite them by thinking more detail in terms of software. It can be difficult to take notes while your client is describing the software. It may be a very logical move to record your speech like in digital media or like, like recording a video, recording the voices or something. Like sometimes you may need to have multiple meetings with the client, not just one. So be prepared carefully. Right now in the screen, I'm sharing what my client wants to do as an example. Read and notice the shortcomings. Even try yourself and try to write user requirements. So as you can see right now, what they want and what is the problem? This is the question. A library owner wants to be able to easily see the books in his library. When I give a book to someone, like some visitor or someone like that they that comes to the library, they want to be able to see when they will get that book back. In the future, the library will have a mobile application. Never forget, this is a really important point. But for now, they say it only works on the web. Just make, they say just make a web application. Just, I just want to like log in and give someone to give someone a book and just want to record that uh, process. More than one librarian will enter the system and perform transactions at the same time. The library is very busy at the certain times of the day and there are too many transactions. It means there are too many transactions means that every librarian will give like will enter will enter some records to the to the system to the database actually i mean we gotta think more wide open right like there are gonna there are gonna be so so many so many transactions it means like there are gonna so many requests per second they're currently using excel for book tracking this is very slow and gives bad user experience for them this is what library owner tells us in the first meeting. So, I mean, like um, with this, you, you can just stop the video and try to take the user requirements from this, only this paragraph, okay? Only this meeting will give you some user requirements. So, so let's go to the second step, the set user requirements. Yeah, we listened to the client and recorded what is said. We have released several user requirements and it's not over. I'll show you what, what I just take. It's not over. Like, you know, like we will send these requirements to the customer and ask for revision for adjustment again. In this way, we will basically be ready to issue software technical requirements. Examine the user requirements that I have extracted right now in the screen and try to interpret them. So right now I already opened the user requirements and let's, let's talk about those. So there will be three different roles in the system as administrator, employee and guest as known as visitor. There will be an employee module, of course. Guests will be able to search for books, of course, and inquire about their activity status. Guests will be able to search and view their books. Guests can become members. Guests will be able to see the books they borrowed from the past. It means there is going to be user table, there is going to be guest table or like books table, sorry. And both table will be linked in some middle table, right? I mean, like I'm just thinking right now. Only administrators can create, delete and update employees. 
it means there is going to be a roll system employees can change the visibility of the book okay that's cool they cannot delete of course because it's not a good thing to delete a book if some other people has that book before right employees i mean like employees may hand a book to a guest of course employees can optionally give a book to guests for a time like for example giving the book for 30 days okay you're gonna give me that book back after 30 days employees can see who owns the books and how long they have had them okay these are the user requirements so let's go to the third step setting technical requirements we talk and discuss with the client and as a result all the requirements are ready now we begin to determine the requirements on the technical side some experience will be required at this point because you gotta see what he really wants what i really want what i really need actually that's that's the real question because to be able to know what you need you gotta like have some experience or you gotta know what you want what you're searching right i mean like if you've tested many things in the industry before you should be realizing what works best and where for example if you need to process hundred thousands of data per second my sql unfortunately will not be the good solution i mean i will not be a good database choice you should consider no sql solutions like dynamodb or like mongodb or to think to think more simply if your client wants to use the same software and in a mobile application in the future designing a rest api should come to your mind directly otherwise you'll you'll have to spend more time in the future and make all your service stateless of course this will incur cost to you and to your client now let's examine the technical requirements i already prepared right now i already mm, separated the table like in the three three parts first backend frontend database so like let's start from backend actual database is easier like i'm gonna choose of course mysql as a rds database relational database system and of course there is gonna be a caching system because i don't want the user always wait for the books to see like to which which books is available which books are like when they were searching a book it just had to be fast i'll, I'll use redis elastic cache redis service from aws or like maybe in the um in the development process i just want to like don't i just don't want to spend money let's say i can use java in memory cache java is already is already providing a in memory cache system for the api endpoints so the first part is like let's go to the backend step backend part actually like i'm gonna use java as a programming language and also spring boot mvc for rest api spring boot dev tools for faster development because you, you know like dev tools is helping us to faster development what i mean for faster like if i activate the faster if, if i activate the dev tools in spring boot i don't need to stop and run the server every time i make some changes you know like there is a there is a there is a feature in visual studio called like any any id has that feature actually how to reload you don't need to stop and run all the all the time you made changes in your code it just like automatically trigger the hot reload it just like stop and run again it just automatically do that so in that case i will use that tools every time i want to use fourth thing is the spring boot actuator for half and metric check of course i'll show you in the like next steps in the one when i write when i draw the architecture for aws you'll see like there is going to be load balancer auto scaling groups but load balancer has an option to half check to send some half request are you okay saying like are you okay to the instances the ec2 instances of course there is two but sometimes ec2 instance seems fine but the java project is also like having some trouble this can happen in the in the future development or like production process so um the spring boot actuator has an endpoint called health like actuator slash health i'll i'll use this one also and like some metric checks of course there's there are so many things in the spring boot actuator i'm not gonna detailly dive deep so the fifth part is gpa and of course it's called as known as hibernate for database connections because hibernate is going to give me the opportunity to to use more than one database like in the future easily like integrating implementing some other database like let's say my my sql is not a good choice like maybe in the future it's, it's not going to be a good choice maybe i can choose i can change the database to postgresql or like ms sql in the future you never know but hibernate is a very good um very good choice for the database connections and like any management the sixth one is the spring boot validation of course the validation is really important for the api endpoints and also any the managements so let's say you wanna i mean like you don't want an employee save 
some book with less than two characters in the name like maybe you 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 want to put some validation before the saving process that will help us in the Spring Boot like in the Java. The seventh one, GUnit for testing. The testing is the most important parts in the development process. Like and GUnit is the one of the best test tool, testing tools for unit testing. So uh, we're gonna test every method, like not the whole controller, not the endpoints, but every method. Like, is it working? Is the saving working good? Are the validation methods working? is like this kind of unit testing, like like this um, specific part. That way you're gonna use GUnit. I'll show you in the next parts of the video. Also the eighth part is Jenkins for CI CD. CI CD is the one of the one of the other good parts in the development process. You wanna continuously integrate and you wanna continuously deploy some process because you don't wanna do um, like you don't wanna do the manual things because these kind of things takes your time and it will incur cost of course the time cost the most important one of the most important things in the i mean like builds the software development process so the uh, tent part is docker for containerization like well, i want to put everything in every server fa as fast as i can do and this time docker will help also docker can help me on the on the like local when i'm developing the project in the local docker will help me in every time because my sql is also the, has a has a Docker image. Also like Jenkins has a Docker image. Everything has a Docker image actually, like most of like, not everything, but of course that you can put, I mean, so many things in a Docker image. And Docker images are like serverless, like like I can say it's, it's a serverless thing. <laughs> you can just like take and put somewhere else, it's gonna work there too. The 11th part, this Mokito for mock data test. I'll use Mokito for mock data test. Like, uh, what, what do I mean for mock data? I say, so let's say, I mean, like there are two types like in the test, unit test and the mock, mock data test. Um, mock data will help you. Actually, the Mokito will help you on the endpoint test, like the real user, how a real user will send a request to you. It's like you're mimicking to the real user. You're wearing the user's shoes and you're just like acting like you are a user. And you're just sending a, a sending some requests to the endpoint and you're just like waiting for a data and these kind of things they i mean like mokito is going to be really helpful i'll show you some examples in the next parts of the video of course so um the 12th part is the spring boot security for securing connections this is the really 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 important part of the api i mean like when you're writing a when you're developing a web service like right now we are going to do that you need authorization and authentication authentication is going to be the on is going to be like mostly on the client part to send some requests to the backend but the authorization is going to be help us to secure the endpoints we don't want everyone can easily send some requests to the to our endpoints right because maybe like okay books endpoint can be open to everyone because like everyone want to see the books in the library right you don't need to be a member like or you know you don't need to be a visitor for the um library but what do you think about the employee update like you want to um, you want to update an employee's name or like email or something else so you do you want everyone can do that no, of course, there is going to be authorization part. Uh, actually, when we, are, when we are getting to the REST API design, we are going to speak about this also, like I'm going to explain a little bit more. So let's go to the front end part. We are going to use a React as a JavaScript framework because React is one of the, I mean, like for me, it's one of the best frameworks um, in this industry right now for the JavaScript, as a, uh, we can, we, if, if you can see it as a JavaScript framework. Second one, the app design. App design is like the... I, I feel really comfortable when I'm writing some ant design components and it's getting easier actually for me the development process but you can choose any other design uh, UI library like material UI I mean there's some other UI libraries too Axios for HTTP requests so we are going to create an API base like Axios instance in the React repository, you gotta check that instance, of course, in the GitHub repository. My, I mean, library UI is, is called library UI. You're just gonna go to the, go to that repository and check the API base client that I write, and um, you're gonna see that you're gonna love that that API client is helping me anywhere, and it's like really, really, really flexible and scalable API client. I just don't want 
I mean, like, you're not gonna copy and paste everywhere the code, like the HTTP request, like put patch, post get, blah, blah. Anyway, the fourth part is like the, I mean, like router, we need a router, right? Like we, we gotta need a, in the front end part, we gotta need a profile page, we gotta need a home page, we gotta need a book page, and like some other page if we need, we're gonna need a React router for routing. So right now we are, these are the things that I that we need. So the next step is going to be draw UML diagrams. So now that we have prepared our technical requirements and we will draw out how the users will do the actions in the loop next. This will be very useful for us to embody everything. It will be very useful for functions we need to add code. At the same time, the more detailed we can make these, di these diagrams, the better. I'm trying to show you an example in a general. For example, let's examine the diagrams for the admin users. So I already opened an admin UML diagrams. You can see the employee and users in the UML diagrams in the description below in the diagrams web page. Okay, it's not like I mean like, I I I didn't want to just do so so many so much complicated, but like these kind of things need at least this much thing. Okay, at least, but you can just like scale anything, anything. You I'm, I'm, uh, let me show you. So let's say admin, admin want to create an employee, right? Admin can able to, admin able to create an employee. And you just go to login to app, see list of employees, clicks at the employee button and employee added. I mean, like he's, he's going to, he's going to write some, uh, so he's going to fill some inputs, of course, but like, I just didn't include those parts, but you got to include for detailed and easier development process. And then when employee added, just go back to the C list of employees and the admin be able to see the employee that he add. So right now what we can add here. So let's say log into app, do some authentication and see list of employees. If the user password is, I mean, like if the authentication part is broke, let's say user password is wrong. Just show an error. Your credentials are not correct say okay go to go back to the login page and go go again then if the authentication is correct see list of employees when this when he sees when he'll be able to see the list list of employees just click the add employee button and when, when he clicked add employee button fill some inputs the put some inputs some validations in front end also in the back end let's say he passed the validation but it was actually a broke or like server is doesn't server doesn't work or like it, this kind of things happen put some other part put some other arrow to link link with that thing put something if this happened do this if this happened do this it's like a, there is something there is an a, aws service called step functions this can also is really um this is really um similar to the uml diag the diagrams but step functions is working more dynamically and more i mean like these kind of things like for the users part like i mean like acting like a user what would you do it's like writing an algorithm like writing a pseudocode we can say it i mean like there are so many uh, uml diagrams but i just want to show you some things really important as you can see there is a thing i just paste a note sticky note potential additional requests first admin can block a guest admin can delete a guest or user right i mean this admin admin should be able to do that but i just like put a sticky note i mean like you gotta put some notes for future requests for from the client or someone else. So um, as you can see, I mean, like I try to how I, I try to draw how the admin user will do a CRUD operation in general. I neglected to take a few notes. If you take notes in this way, you can easily see the points that you can pay attention to while designing your system. At the same time, I would like to point out that this diagram is not at its best at the moment. We also need to add some error statement. Like I said before, for example, the admin may receive some errors when trying to update an employee, like maybe validation error, maybe email error, maybe that email is used by another employee, these kind of things. Try to see the potential errors from the front and arrange the flow accordingly. Also, like I'm just gonna say it again, don't forget to check the file I share in the description below okay never forget it so let's go to the next step we're gonna draw some system designs most of you guys like re probably remember this thing the system design it's coming from the interviews like mo most of the software engineers knows how to design a system but sometimes it can be a little bit tough like being able to draw a system design is very important step in software development. I mean, like many people skip this. However, it's not difficult at all. You just need to be able to embody how the functions in your system works. 
For example, a user want to send a request to one of your secure endpoints. You want to put some authentic authorization, right? How that works? Let's say you want to add some employee or you want to get some books from the server. How that functions work in the server side? Like I'm, I'm not saying, hey, I'm just going to send a request to database and I'm, it's going to search the queries, come back, that's it. It's not like that much simple. You want to put some other things like the caching system, like the request parts, these kind of things. So, I mean, like, um, as an example, like I want to show you, uh, that's really bad. That's really good way. I want to show you how the system works when a site visitor, let me show you here, when a site visitor wants to see the books, but there's more than one function on the system like this. As I said before, you'll have to draw them all separately, not so detailedly, but to be able to see, to make it embody. Like, I mean, like you want to make something embody and you got to see everything more clear. We don't want something to be abstract, right? Like if something is abstract, you can't see clear. It's not really real. Absolutely. Abstract, abstract things is not like real things. Let's go and examine the try interpret. So right now, sorry for my like little bit bad. I mean, sorry for my drawing ability. I'm not really good at drawing. I just like use my pencil on the touchpad. This kind of things is getting harder. But anyway, the important part is the purpose, like the goal. So like um, we are going to send a get request to the books. There is a user and user will connect with the app, right? App server, app instance. This can be like in your, this can be your like load balancer or something. There can be something in the between user and the app. Of course, we are going to put a load balancer. This should be load balancer, not the app. Load balancer will connect with the app. Then the app will check first the cache because if app check the database every time a user wants to list the books wants to see the books every books in the library i mean it can be really 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 expensive after a start certain time because like sending a request to the database is just like adding some other layer to the process of request because when we add some other layer we just increase the latency uh, for the request users don't want to wait for like for for to see the books think about it like instagram or twitter there is going to be a like feed there is a feed here in the twitter if you can i mean if you gotta wait if you gotta wait like one minute for to see some tweets in the feed page the home page what would you do just like leave the app right who, who wait for one minute? Think about it. Actually, tweet is like a little bit hardest part to, to take the tweets because tweets are already always changing, but some other tweets, some tweets like always in the system. Anyway, I'm not going to go over to the Twitter design and like to take, get the tweets, get the tweet feed. I'm not going to go over that design, but like in, in, in the in this place you got you can easily see the caching and database and if you if but first you gotta check the cache if the same books are still in the cache just directly show it to the user that's the easiest part if the cache is not like really 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 new just check database and put some put the data in the cache and show it to user Right now, you just like refresh the data. But I mean, mm, this kind of system, you can't cache every endpoint, right? Because like books, think about books. Every day, librarians, think about that. Like, every day, librarians will add hundreds of books. Is it possible? No. I mean, like after like maybe 10,000 books, they are not going to add it more. Maybe like in one week, one or two. This means books can be cacheable you can cache the books and point of course this is the like the real neural thinking process um like i just showed you what i did as, as a summary the user sends a request to the server for it for for the books the server on the other hand should prefer to look at the caches first rather than sending a request to the database each time because keeping the database busy every time will be extremely costly at peak times for it. It should examine the caches and then show the books directly to the user more quickly. But the books in caches may not always be up to date. That's why we have to synchronize the data from the database at a certain frequency. Fortunately, Redis, like Elastic Cache Redis, and in-memory cache systems do this for us. 
So this is what the system design and like let's go to the draw AWS architecture. That's that one is like one of the best thing I love in this industry and I love really love AWS architecturing like drawing some AWS architecture like make some highly available highly scalable architectures is my one of my best points actually <laughs> one of my favorite spots at the same time I can confidently make such drawings with the confidence of being an AWS certified developer thanks to AWS <laughs> now we have prepared the system designs and we can more or less imagine what kind of thing what kind of architecture we need but preparing an AWS architecture is not that simple there are some rules and steps we have to define let's take a look at the design in the screen right now so as you can see there are so many things here like I can see the users I can do root 5 root 53 and I can see the cloud front inherent gateway web application firewall s3 cloud watch blah blah there are so many things but but you can easily see like how secure this system and how can how um, available this system is because like the load balancer helps us auto scaling groups helps us you can see the redis caches and database systems like the I'm, I'm, i use the rds database like as a my as my sql there is a master and slave this can this is really helpful and we are linking the master and slave databases to the S3. Also, we are linking the S3 with the cloud front. If something wrong with the server, if some like maintenance thing happens, or if server can't be reachable, cloud front request goes directly to the S3 and get some static website. Maybe it's your website from uh, that you did on react or like some html content hey we are in the maintenance right now sorry for the delay just take try again later blah blah and um, here you can see the cloudwatch thing you can check so many logs in the cloudwatch you can put some alerts like the cpu or like ram or memory usage you can put everything you can check everything the cloudwatch is really important i just connect with cloudwatch with the elastic beanstalk container and of course we're gonna use elastic beanstalk so I mean what I said before is there are some rules and steps we have to follow right now I know this architecture has some gaps and room for improvement on the design but remember that every design is open to development and has shortcomings there are dozens of services on AWS that can improve our design but my aim is generally to show that we have to apply certain rules correctly we always need to prepare highly available and scalable design at the same time we need to know the rules of the six pillars of AWS well architecture framework after making a design we'll need to examine these rules in detail now let's examine these six pillars for our own AWS architecture of the first pillar is operational excellence the goal of operational excellence is to get new features and bug fixes into clients hands quickly and reliably handling failures via CloudWatch alerts and continuously integrating the new features via elastic beanstalk from CI CD connections the architecture has an operational excellence pillar. The second pillar is security. The goal of the security pillar is to provide maximum secure architecture. Using HTTPS connections help us to secure the data in transit and using encrypted, encrypted RDS services helps us to secure the data at rest. Also app and data services are in the private subnet right within the security group. They only send data to the NAT gateway in this public subnet because the private subnet has a really 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 important feature for the security they only accept outbound traffic to the public subnets and they never accept inbound they are that's a really other good option for like using this private subnets and the public subnets uh, as a security measure because like we gotta put the application servers in the private subnet we gotta put databases in the private subnet we gotta put the readers cache elastic cache the caching systems caching services we gotta put them into the private subnets and the public subnets only like maybe web services like the react page or some other i mean like open things we can put public subnet those things but we gotta use net gateway to connect with the private subnets uh, between the internet right anyway the third step is going to be reliability the goal of reliability is pillar is to provide maximum availability in case of failures of some services when something failed we gotta do something using elastic load balancers and auto scaling groups we don't guess the capacity if 
there are so many load in the server, elastic load balancers are gonna work for us. And also the, it's going to work with ASG and like we're gonna scale out and scale in the server, the EC2 instances. Like if something is wrong with the instances, they will restart instance or like terminate the instance and create new one. That's their, that's their job. The performance efficiency is the fourth one. Like the goal of the performance efficiency pillar is to use computing resources efficiently to meet system requirements and, and, and to maintain that efficiency as demand change and technology evolve. Performance efficiency is like this pillar. I mean, like the best way to have this architecture, this pillar is by using several services like Lambda, Redis, etc. In this case, we use a load balancer and auto scaling groups to meet this pillar. But like also for the serverless part, if you can check that part too, we use Redis caching from AWS. The fifth part is cost optimization. The most, one of the most important parts, like the goal of the cost optimization, this pillar is to run systems to deliver business will you at the lowest price point we use that auto scaling group to use only the needed piece of instances is scale out and scale in automatically also we use elastic cache for redis to not send a request to database every time of course we already talked about it the sixth and the last part of the pillar, the sixth pillar, sustainability. The goal of the sustainability pillar is to address the long-term environmental, economic, and societal impact of your business. Using Elastic Beastal is giving us the opportunity to manage, as manage the framework easily. Also, our choice of region is really, really, really important. I mean, think about it, like most of your users are, I mean, connecting your website from like Europe, let's say in France, you gotta open and open, you gotta create your Elastic Beanstalk environment in France, in the France region. If you create your environment in the United States region, there is gonna be latency. Of course, there are some other solutions for this, like maybe you can use some VPC peering or some other thing from the AWS, but that doesn't make sense if your users only coming from France, right? So, I mean, like I'll be exploring these six pillars in more detail in another like video um next like maybe i share it on the medium post soon you can follow me on medium or like you can just subscribe this channel thanks so let's go to the next step it's called draw the er diagram i mean like in fact if the architecture is ready now our database is next we gotta i mean draw the, the database di diagram because we cannot move to the rest api to see the endpoints generally without preparing the database for this we need to consider the possible tables in the system you gotta need some little experience to see some um how to use how do you, how you say that to see some future request future features to write to draw some databases okay but like let's take a look at the er diagram i, I the er diagram i prepared um let me check here here i mean like right now we have four tables this is one of the easiest diagrams ever users books roles and guest books okay four different diagrams users will have the full name username email password and the role id the role id is important because every user has a role like admin employee or the visitor or like guest how would you say it and also books have some name number of page offer image s3 id and is visible i just like put these kind of things like the image is the, the images are coming from the s3 like if the books is not like visible just like make it false every book has an offer or like the if we can connect the user and books in a table it will be perfect right like this table is going to be called guest books the user id book id date to return and the returned date um these kind of things that i just hold in the hand like i just can i mean like this is the easiest one of the easiest diagram diagrams can you can see i mean like multiple users be linked with a single single role these kind of things i'm not gonna uh, talk about this much but we're gonna see it in the coding process of course but at the same time like i mean like as i said before is one of the simplest diagrams you'll ever see once you understand this diagram you can develop it further you can add some other features some other tables like i mean like i was i was thinking maybe you can just take the offer from the books and you can put some other um table called authors and you can just link those together maybe you can do that i mean this was the simplest one of the simplest things and once i mean like because in order to draw diagrams with dozens of tables you need to be able to uh, draw such simple diagrams right so let's go to the next step the next step is going to be prepare the rest api design this 
is one of my favorite areas again like the aws architecture just preparing the rest api design and writing code developing the rest the design i i, I made is one of the best things and one of the best feelings actually because starting to design the rest api means are we are very close to coding let's not forget that we have written a single line of code yet because we should never ever jump directly to the coding that will be the worst move we could have made so when designing a rest api we must comply with coding standards there are some standards of course in the rest api design you cannot just like randomly do some rest api endpoints this is not correct and this is not easy to understand actually because um, this will be very useful if you use the standards this will be very useful for us when developing in the future when you give the your software to another one to another developer the, the another developer it will be easier for the for the other developer to understand right it also allows us to create scalable structure now let's examine the design i prepare let me open it here i will also like to record a video about rest api designs because it's the one of the i mean like most important parts in the software development process when if you're developing a web service so as you can see there are so many parts but we gotta start from the middle like the center of the tape center of the design it's called rest rest as a link with methods so we have the like one of the most important links in the rest api design the methods methods has five different method right in right now in the http request we have five different method delete put post get patch the one of the i mean like i'm not gonna go deep deep dive into this diagram but when i drawing this diagram i always check like what do i have and what will i have because when you see the delete endpoint you'll see the users slash some parameter called user id but we don't put books slash book i mean like the parameter of the book book id because i mean like the requirements we didn't put some requirement for the i mean admins can delete some books we didn't put that because we are not gonna put it when we write everything here everything will work correctly because we're gonna see what we're gonna write what we're gonna develop like a, as a function as a method as an endpoint but one of the other important one most important things is the pagination filtering and ordering resource naming resource naming is one of the most important thing because if you have a resource if you have a database like called the users you cannot put in the users controller some books endpoints this is like really bad idea also the other very important thing is versioning and the caching i mean let's let me talk about like some uh, let me talk, let me talk about like some versioning part we have three different type of versioning like when you want to put some versions in your api endpoints like the version one version two version three you can put this in the url example.com slash version one slash books this is I mean like this this tells the server that i'm gonna use the version one endpoint or like version one function but also there is another uh, and there's another thing we can send this version as a query parameter like you know there is a question mark you can just write version equals one or something else you can use it also this one and the third part is using the headers you can send api dash version equals version 1.0 or something i prefer mostly the header header versioning because i think it's i think it's easier to understand easier to use easier i mean like it's scalable actually but um you can use anything well i mean you gotta just check what you really need because i think it's more scalable for me and doesn't extend the url unnecessarily because i just want to want the url simple and understandable in um, these kind of things you know like this another part is of course the off the authorization you gotta choose what kind of authorization you should choose authorization choice is really important there are so many things in the rest api design as you can see these design things you can check this design detailly but i'll share some i'll record some video about the rest api design like one by one everything i, I will cover it but let's go to the next step because I just don't want to spend your time mostly. So the next step is going to be draw the user interface. You're going to see my best, my really good drawing ability here again. But let me just go over it a li little bit because you need to draw the pages that will be shown to the user, right? Because to make it embody 
is the secret, okay? Simply imagine and draw all the pages individually as if you are drawing them in, an, in a notebook, like using your pencil, sketching, like making some other components with the pen. Just Imagine it. Create components to implement all your design UML diagrams. Identify them. It will be very helpful when coding. Well, I'll just give an example on the home page. However, you can see and examine the drawings of the other page from the diagrams. Link I shared at the description below. Okay. Let me just go over from over to the home page. Uh, sketching is really bad. I know. I know. You can see it. Is is really bad. But I mean, you can see the header. You can see some books, and you can see a search bar in, in the between the header and books, and you can see the pagination, the one of the most important thing and in between the books and the footer and let's see the real design i just already i already coded these things and here you can see there is a book search that this is really clear right because as you can see things get better when coded <laughs> so this is this kind of things it's like i'm just putting some um home, i just put the example of home page let's go the next step is the prepare ci cd flow okay this is one of the other most important thing the last step before moving to on the coding drawing the ci cd stage okay this step is actually very important as i said again because it's a very very costly process to build the project every time zip manually and connect to the server from the terminal and replace it with the current project this is really really costly and most importantly it's not scalable but everything is automated thanks to the ci cd process you are simply pushing the development you have written into your version control system github in this example ci cd works for you and gets your code live you just deal with the development now let's examine the workflow as you can see in the system in the, in the screen sorry um right now you can see github jenkins and elastic beanstalk it's really simple you can just make it complicated of course like there you can add some odd some inside jenkins stage like you can do some pre-build or post-build things um but i just make i just try to make it simple ci cd is a really simple thing um you have a github server jenkins and the elastic beanstalk in the aws part when you push some some commits to the github or like may, maybe you can merge something to your master or main branch the jenkins this guy will check every minute or like every five minutes it's up to you you can just choose the schedule time like choose like maybe put a crunch up but this guy checks the github your repository then it triggers the jenkins build process it takes your repository it builds it it makes the tests and deploy it to the aws elastic beanstalk it's really it's really 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 good process james as you can see it, jenkins is running to our aid at this stage one of my favorite ci cd tools of course aws code deploy is one other one in the second place <laughs> but i'm thinking of preparing an article article like maybe like some recording a video about the ci cd processes uh soon don't forget to stay tuned by the way just don't forget to subscribe or like follow my medium account so the next step is make the version control system connections okay this is the other part other step like we are right now coding however we need to keep a record of what we have coded and be able to return to it easily it's also a very valuable thing for us to see our progress right you want to see your progress what did you do before what did you do today what did you do last week blah blah I prefer Git most of the times, like 99% of my times. I also use the Azure or like Heroku before, but Git actually is, I mean, like the most, the, I feel the most comfortable, okay? Create your, I'm like, we're gonna create our new repository in your GitHub account and like and link it with your editors. We create your projects and make your first commits. I'm not gonna go deep dive into this. Like it's the, I mean, one of the easiest things in the development process at this point, the branch system comes into play, okay? Like there are some branches in the GitHub. What are branches? Frankly, if you're working alone, I'm against opening different branches and developing there. I mean, if you're working alone, it's okay to push master <laughs> like to push main because i mean i mean obviously you're working alone and there is nothing gonna be conflict or some other thing okay but if you're working with more than one developer you should definitely create branches for the developments to be made and send your code star like if you have some up some bug fix on the user update part user update process or if you have some bug fix on the front end part you gotta create a branch about that bug fix or like about the um, improvement and you can just 
move on that branch, you can just improve that branch too. Then you can just push, give a pull request, request a pull, I mean, you know, how, how do you say, and just merge it to your main branch. You can just work so many developer in the same branch. That's how it is. So um, the next step, I'm just not gonna step. I'm just I'm not, I'm not gonna stay in this step so much. The next step is going to be write your code. Of course, the first site because I'm writing Java with Spring Boot is gonna be the starts.spring.io. Since I prefer Spring Boot and Java while coding, below you can. I'm mean, like right now in the screen you can see which services I choose to start. Okay, I already told you in the technical requirements part we're going to use the dev tools web security from spring and the validation from hibernate and the jgpa from the sql the java persistence api coming from the hibernate also using actually sorry the actuator is coming is going is going to help us on the metrics and the half checks the i mean like you can review the github repository right now in the in in the description below but um, let me show you actually from my screen so you can easily see the uh, structure I use for the folder structure and I mean you, you gotta you gotta be able to scale the structure easily you gotta be separate everything part by part that like configuration is going to be stay somewhere constants and controllers are going to stay of course in some other package in the java and you're going to see the resources like the application properties like the data that comes in that's that queries to the database before building your application like you can you you can just add some mock data to to it as you can see i already uh, insert some mock data here um, let me show you here like this okay I already have some mock data here you there are so many things here but um, it's just like some simple thing for testing purposes okay so um, here you can see let's go to the book controller and right now you can easily see the rest controller uh, annotation from Java Spring Boot and you can see the dependency injection that in uh, that I inject the book repository because I want to be able to uh, use the hibernate functions like find all find by ID delayed by ID delayed late all remove all some kind of things I want to be able to use those and I just implement the re I just inject the repository to the book controller so I can easily I can easily use as you can see right now there is like if you can just really close check I'm, I'm using the headers in the queries at the book controller there is a header version like this is coming from the constant is called version 1.0 and there is a path and also the one of the other most important thing it's coming with the annotation called cacheable and there is a name of the cacheable in is, is there's a name of the cache uh, the caching naming like it's called books I just do it on the on the configuration part you can check everything in the repository but i'm just going to show you uh, like the really 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 um general things as you can see there are some request params like the, they can search it by name offers and also they can search other parts like maybe their visibility or some other things and also there is a sorting parameters like the sort by id or like sort direction will be ascend or descend like there is of course it's going to be pageable you can check everything in the repositories i'm not going to just deep dive on, on to them but here in the soul in the structure you can see i already separated the exceptions from their normal project i don't like to use like the throw new exception do this i just want to use throw new book not found exception i just want to throw some other request body exception i just want to throw user not found exception like this kind of things you can check every exception model i already do i already coded you can see the models of course in the same part and you can see every repository i use like book repository guest book repository role and user repositories you can check everything but i'm not gonna stay here so much i just want to go over to the next step just do the tests when you code you gotta do some tests if your code is working correctly or not working good you gotta make some tests so the g unit for unit testing is gonna help us in this in this uh, step and the mokito is here for direct testing for our endpoints at the same time it's scalable you know uh, like because it's test on mock data you can just put so much data on it i want to show an example request in the screen right now you can see it in the screen uh, this is a mock mokito it's coming from mokito you can see um it should it should i mean like we are expecting to returning success this endpoint this test and there are some 
uh, records here we, we are creating some list and mokito is just trying to find all from the repository that we inject the test class then return records okay that's cool so the re next step is the mock mvc the mock mvc will perform some test to some endpoint and the header the api version we 1.0 this will be the api version the content type will be the application json and expecting the status will be okay it's like 200 the status code then it will expect another thing hey okay the status is 200 that's perfect but how many data i have right now we are expecting that uh, the data will be 10 records and uh, the second data the actually the first sorry the third data data's name will be something designing blah blah the book name you know like this we're just like expecting this is this correct is this we're expecting this do we get this we're expecting these kind of things so this kind of test things like mokito i love i love mokito i love mokito more than unit testing but it's okay to do unit testing as as you can see i already create some and create some functions to make some unit testing you can easily to see you can easily see what is the difference between mokito and unit testing unit test is just like testing the specific things like creating a user you can see it in the screen and just like try to find it from the database hey is this user is correctly saved if saved it's okay if not it just stop okay these are the testing part also testing is not that much simple so you just use the unit testing you just use the mojito and you got to do some other test maybe you can use selenium to test on chrome or test on some headless browsers or test on some the other browser like firefox or some other thing but we already we, we also have to do some performance and load testing so what is that we're going to use jmeter okay jmeter is going to help us to performance and load testing in the same time and we can um, well, what is performance and load testing i already show you I'm, I'm not right now probably in the screen you see the how the load time and latencies are changing in the um, process of sending request because I'm sending some requests to the books endpoint, but not only one request per second. Okay, if I send hundreds of requests per second to the books endpoint, how that will interact, how that will affect the performance of the application, the how how will be the latency is going on? Like this is the questions. Um, right now you can see it in the screen. The latency and the load time is decreasing really 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 much because of the cache okay elastic cache is really really perf really really working perfect on this time and also you can use the java in memory cache i use java in memory for the development purposes but you can use elastic cache redis of course um i because i know redis is also really perfect i used it um, i used it so many times in the previous projects redis is really good and and this kind of things is really perfect that's what uh, that's what the uh, testing is actually so um of course it's getting more and more complex if you just dive deep but these are the things like really general things for me to show you okay so next step is going to the bring the aws architecture to live okay when it comes to bringing our aws architecture to live it can be one of the most painful for some okay some people never like this part because it's actually there are some other specific points like because the more complex the design you prepare the more adjustments you'll have to make one of the most complicated parts is dealing with security groups i know because i worked so hard at the time because private subnets never receive outside traffic in order to send traffic to outside they must be connected with the net gateways in public subnets this one was just a simple challenge I created an environment in Elastic Beanstalk, for example, um, and created an XSK for the Jenkins, of course. Um, I'm not gonna deep dive to it. I'm like, this is not a course for deploying AWS, just showing how I do actually. The next step is going to be to bring the CI CD flow to life. I mean, like, since we prefer for Jenkins for CI CD, we need to install it first. I already explain everything the installment process in the github repository you can check the documents in there and i explain in detail blah 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 but one of the most important things would of course be to set a check frequency for ci cd okay it will be best to prepare for a cron job in the build triggers section of the manage configuration section in jenkins okay there is a build triggers part you gotta 
put some frequency to check GitHub commits, GitHub merge, GitHub branches, you know. You can set it to check the GitHub webhook. Git webhook every one minute. Every one minute is going to be easy actually. And the next step actually we are going to the end. Uh, actually we are really close. Deploy. You gotta deploy the things. Now it's I mean like it's time to deploy our project. We shared the documents we wrote. We deployed our project. If our DNS and name servers settings are ready in the root 53, our project will not be accessible from all over the world. Let's not forget to do our live test. It's always best to retest all functions, okay? Never, never, never skip this part. So the last part actually, tracking the errors, tracking the bugs, the things, you know, the things happening, how much uh, memory is using right now, how much is CPU, how much CPU is using, like well, what, what are the, alerts i mean like we gotta put some alerts of course in the cloud watch in the aws like remember okay remember that it's not possible to create a system with zero errors or bugs every system has bugs every system can break and every system can crash for this we have to follow the errors both from the client and from the AWS services such as CloudWatch, X-Ray, etc. We should take regular database snapshots like backups and examine the load balancer, health checks. But there are many more things we can improve, I know. But for now, these are the only ones I can think of and record about okay i'm very excited to create new articles and it makes me very happy to share my experiences with you in this way at the same time i contribute a little to the industry the software industry and i wish it to be a day when we break our boundaries and learn new things thank you for watching and i hope you like the video if you like the video just click the like button and subscribe my channel if it's possible for you and if you have some questions like for aws architecture or some other some other things about the steps i already talked about you just like comment below and i will be really happy to help you guys okay so thank you so much and you can check the medium post in the description below of course every source and every links in the description below right now thank you for watching again see you in the next video